computer. Okay, we're recording live, it's real. So I just wanna say a big shout out to the sponsors of this program. Um, we had something very, very different planned for this year's Passport to Nature program, but obviously um, the pandemic and COVID has just changed everything. And these sponsors, you know, really support the work that we're doing and so are continuing to um, support this program and make it free for everyone this evening to take part in. So thank you to them. Oh, and also I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Tanya. I'm a staff with uh, the Kuchin Conservancy. Um, we are a nonprofit land trust. We protect over 13,000 acres in the Kuchiching and Severn region. There are two new nature reserves actually this year. Uh, and if you want to find out about those two, there's information on our website. Uh, and all of the work that we do is powered by people like you, people that are on this Zoom webinar right now, people who are members and volunteers and monthly donors, you are all making it happen. And so we're so um, appreciative to work with you to do everything that we do. So this is a overview map of all the different places that we protect. You can go to our website and find details on a lot of these places. There's quite a few of them that have um, trails on them that you can go and visit. Um, anytime you want and so I highly recommend visiting some of these places because as a supporter of the Conservancy and of this work um, this is what you're working towards protecting all of these forests and wetlands so get out there if you can and go and visit them so what we're here for today is our backyard bird feeding webinar with Janet and I can tell you a little bit about Janet um, she is the co-founder of the Conservancy. We were formed in 1993 and um, you know we've done so much stuff over the years. Janet was the owner of the Birdhouse Nature Company in Aurelia for over 21 years and uh, yeah such a great store if you haven't been there you should definitely I would definitely recommend going. Um, she and her husband Ron completed the big year um, which they identified 283 bird species in Ontario, which is incredible. Uh, Janet is a lifelong bird watcher and loves to share her interests and expertise. So to begin, we'll be sharing a video of Janet talking about the best resources to, to use to learn about birds, some different bird feeders, and what birds like to eat. Um, then Janet will be joining us live. She's here, right there. Uh, for a question and answer period. So if you have a question, um, you can put it into the chat box afterwards. Hello everybody and welcome to the webinar of the, this webinar from the Kujiting Conservancy's Passport to Nature program. We're going to be talking about backyard bird feeding or armchair bird watching as I like to call it. I'm going to be talking to you about different kinds of feeders to use to feed the birds and different kinds of seed. Um, but to go in those feeders. And then I'll be talking a little bit about the resources that you can use to help you become more expert. And maybe a little bit about how to set up your yard to make them attractive to the birds. Okay, now there are certain resources that you'll find very useful when you're, when you're backyard bird watching or feeding the birds. The first, of course, is a book so that you can, um, you can identify what you have. This is my favorite. It's made, it's done, it's one of the Peterson Field Guides. And the, what you have to know, know is that there's actually two of these, or three rather. No, there's four. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> this one is for birds east of the Rockies. You get a completely different suite of birds, not completely different, but a whole lot of different birds when you go on the other side of the Rockies. So this is east of the Rockies is the one to go for. And it will have it will have good pictures of all the birds and basic information about them such as their size and identification. And then on the other page there's a little brief description of the bird and, and its, um, its habitat and a little bit about the calls it makes. This one is my favorite because I like, I like the, the, the um, 
the fact that the um, the pictures are, are hand drawn and, and and painted by hand. Some of the um, some of the bird identification guides use photographs, which I'm not as fond of because thank you, because they um, the color tends to be off a little bit. This one is a National Geographic Society book, also birds east of the Rockies, and it's a lovely book as well. A little bit harder to find, but it does have a few good features. Like, for instance, it has compares some plumage of the um, gulls. And gulls can be very, very sea unknown to some people as seagulls, but actually their real name is gulls. And they can uh, they can have some very different plumages depending whether they're first year bird or second year bird or third year bird. They can be very confusing. I don't suggest starting off your bird watching career by trying to identify gulls. They're very difficult. This one is a dandy little book if you can find it. That is. It's called Bridges of Ontario. It's published by Lone Pine and is currently out of print. So you might be able to find it online or maybe on Amazon or something like that, but it's it's very hard to find in bookstores right now. Although I believe the Birdhouse Nature Company may still have a few copies if you hurry in. It's just the Ontario birds. And one of the nice things about it is that it has it has a blurb about the bird and its behavior. Which the other field guides don't. The field guides normally just have identification information. Whereas this talks a bit about where the bird lives and what it eats and, and what its behavior is. So you'll learn a lot more about the birds this way. Again, it's called Birds of Ontario by Lone Pine Publishers. When you're first starting to look at the birds, you need to know a little bit about how to identify them. This is a very useful little... I don't know if you can see that all right. Can you see it? Yes? Okay. Most, most identification is done by identifying the field marks on a bird. So for instance, whether, what color is his cap, whether or not it has an eye ring around its eye, or whether it has an eyebrow stripe, and all the different birds, these are called field marks. And they identify the bird by, by looking at the field marks. So you would look at all the different parts of the bird and um, sort of memorize what, where, where the color is and where the striping is, that sort of thing. Any good field guide will have this sort of diagram in it for you. And quite often in the description of the bird, you'll be able to refer to an eye stripe or a rump or undertail coverts or primaries. This last book is a bit of a specialty book. There's a whole suite of little birds called warblers. They're very small and very bright and colorful. Because of the time of year, it's the fall, they're all in their well, the babies, of course, are all in immature plumage and they're very difficult to identify. But when you get to be a little bit better bird watcher, you might want to take on the warblers and see what you can do about identifying them. Incidentally, the American goldfinch, the bright yellow bird that comes to your feeders, the one with the black cap and the black wings, those are its field marks. That's not a warbler, it's actually a finch. Now, the, another resource that's very good to have, to have around of course, it's a pair of binoculars, so you can see the birds up close. There are two basic kinds of binoculars. Two basic shapes, I should say. These are the more modern ones, where there's basically a pair of tubes side by side. And an older version, where the, the tubes are side by side, but they're not parallel like the other one was. Inside of binoculars, you'll get a whole series of prism, prisms and mirrors. So you can see where there would be mirrors and prisms inside these and not so obvious in the other ones. Now binoculars come in a variety of strengths like the magnification power and sizes. So they're generally identified by two numbers. So these for instance are what's called a 7 by 35 and the other ones these are actually 8 by 40. The two numbers refer to, the first number refers to um, the magnification, so these are eight power magnification. And the second number refers to the size of the, of the, of the, um, 
the lens on the end. And that's very important because that determines how much light is allowed into the binoculars. And the more light you can get into your binoculars, the sharper and clearer they're going to be. My basic advice about binoculars is don't spend less than $100 on binoculars because you get what you pay for. You absolutely get what you pay for. And you could probably expect to spend between three and $500. And don't be too scared off by that because you're going to have them for a lifetime. And if you can't see through them, then you've wasted your money. So when you go into a store to look at binoculars, make sure you go into a place that has lots of different kinds and specify that you want bird watching binoculars. Don't be fooled by someone who says, oh, well, these are these you can really see far away. So if you see someone's trying to sell you a pair of 10 power by 50, for instance, the 50 part is wonderful because it'd be nice and bright. But the 10 power is so magnified that they're very hard to hold steady to look at a bird. And they tend to be very large and very heavy. Same thing in the other way goes for smaller compact binoculars. They're great to stick in your pocket, but the trouble is they're very hard to hold steady and they don't magnify very much. Everybody who, who, uses, anybody who uses binoculars may want to know how to adjust what's called the diopter. So you'll see here there's a ring and because nobody's eyes are the same, like the two eyes are usually different, they, it's almost never 2020, it's more like 1921 or something like that. So you have to adjust the binoculars according to, to your own eyes. So when you're standing there at the counter talking with somebody about binoculars, if the salesman does not know how to adjust your, to show you how to adjust your binoculars for the diopter, go somewhere else. He doesn't know enough. <laughs> To help you and try and try and get them to let you take the binoculars out on the street so you can look through them at close range and look through them at far range and that will help you a lot to know whether or not that's a good pair of binoculars for you one pair of binoculars does not fit all by any stretch of the imagination a good example of something to avoid is binoculars that have a really high magnification so for instance i mentioned the 10 by 50 as I said, the 50 part is nice because it's nice and bright, but the 10 power magnification, they're really designed for marine use, for looking very over very long distances, and they don't work well for bird watching because the birds are much closer than that. Okay, the, um, that's, of course, because I'm an old-fashioned person, and I've been doing this for a long time. I love the books, but many people are very interested in what you can get on the internet or as an app um, for birding. I actually do use an app for birding because I like the um, to get the sounds. And the one I use is the one from the Cornell Lab, Cornell University, the um, Lab of Ornithology. It's called Merlin. It's very easy to use. Um, you just Google the Merlin or the Cornell University and, and sort of download it. It's free. And what it gives you is it gives you a whole list of birds like that. And you can actually type in some bird that you want to look up. So we'll look up a blue jay. And it comes up with a picture for me. But the other thing it has, which I really like, is the sounds of a bird. So the blue jay has, my goodness, has about a dozen different calls. So we'll see if we can call in a blue jay. So that's its alarm call, actually. It also gives you a sonogram. There's another call of the Blue Jay. Of course, everybody's very familiar with the chickadee, too, so I'm going to call up a chickadee and see if we can't listen to it as well. So there's our black-capped chickadee that everybody's familiar with, we hope. Notice his field marks. Notice he has white cheeks and a white around, nape around the back of the head with a black cap and a little black beak, a little black bib. These are very friendly, very social birds. I love them. And they're generally the first birds, quite often, to find the feeders when you put them up. So here's a little... Everybody's familiar with the chickadee dee dee call. Now that's what we call the spring song. Spring song.
Birders like to put words to bird songs. And quite often what people think he's saying is cheeseburger, cheeseburger. <laughs> anyway, again, it's called Merlin. It's a very good app. There's several others out there. Some of them cost money. Some of them don't. The Peterson one is quite good. Um, same name as the first book that I showed you. Peterson Field Guide. They often have lots of lots and lots of information. They they do substitute for books, um, but I'm old fashioned and I like having the books around. I like having them to be able to flip through the pages. The other advantage of having a book is that as you are flipping through the pages trying to find the bird you're looking at, you get to learn. You get to learn about the other birds that you haven't seen yet so that when something pops up and you're not familiar with it, you should be able to go, oh, I've seen that in the book. Okay, I know what that is. Which is a nice thing. The birds. So our, so some people are concerned about about feeding the birds and stopping them from migrating. And the thing to know is that the birds that come to feeders are generally not migratory. So they don't leave us for the winter, they stay for the winter. You can feed all year round with no problem. Um, you may need to um, take steps to um, to protect your feeders from things like squirrels. And around our house we have to protect our feeders from bears. <laughs> Which is why we have our feeders outside our windows and hanging from the eaves. So the very everybody is pretty much familiar with the basic sort of wooden bird feeder. We call them hopper feeder. They're generally wooden. Sometimes they're made out of other materials. And there's a huge variety of them on the on sale anywhere you can. Oh by the way, any of the products that I talk about in this video um, are available in, in Aurelia at the birding store in Aurelia. It's called the Birdhouse on Mississauga Street in downtown Aurelia. So this, these hopper feeders are generally, not always, but generally very easy to fill. All you need to do is lift the lid. That wasn't supposed to fall off. <laughs> and fill the feeder through the top. Now hopper feeders are, are, tend to be quite easy to clean as well. So this hopper feeder, in particular, has a, um, a glass side on it that just lifts out, which is nice. And it also has a, um, a screening in the bottom. Point it that way. If we point that towards the camera, then you can see that there's a screening, which helps to keep it dry and keep it cleaner. Clean feeders are quite important for birds because birds, when, they, when they're active at the feeders, they can easily transmit disease amongst themselves got the feeders so they need to be clean. The second general style of bird feeder it's called a tube feeder. And they tend to be some sort of a polycarbonate or a plastic tube with holes in it and perches. Now this particular one they're also very easy to fill. You just lift off the lid and um, pour the seed down in the top. This particular one is for larger grains like sunflower seed or peanuts. Um, you can see the large hole where the birds access the um, access the seed and then there are perches underneath the holes to make it easier for them to access it. It also happens to have an additional item on it. This feeder I put on a tray because sometimes you don't want all the any um, excess food or shells on the ground because it attracts squirrels and, and some of the ground feeders you may not want. So that's an extra piece that you can put onto many of these tube feeders. Now th that's the two basic kinds of feeders. Um, and they tend to be related to the kind of seed that you're putting in them. So they're, they're designed for that. Both these feeders I've just shown you are very good for the larger grains for sunflower seed especially. Um, a third way of feeding the birds is to use a a suet feeder of some kind. And this this particular one has a cage around it to keep the squirrels out. Because they will they will clean off a suet cake in no time flat. So if you can see in the center of this one, there's um a spot you can put the square cakes of suet, which are available in many different places. But be careful about your quality because the birds know the difference. Suet is actually the fat on the beef on the kidney of a beef animal. 
it's not just body fat it's actual actual fine very fine fat that tends to collect around the, the kidney of the beef animal pig fat does not work it's not really very good for the birds it hasn't got the right nutritional qualities I should talk a little bit about bird seed both these feeders are very good for sunflower seed which I'm just showing in my hand here now as you can see this particular bird seed is not the old striped kind it's the called black oil sunflower seed and the reason for that is because it has a much higher oil content than the old striped kind of sunflower seed and it's the one that's largely grown in North America now it is grown all over North America um, now most birds will, will, will cut off, will chew off or use their beaks to, to um, remove the shell to get out the kernel that's inside these hopper feeders will also dispense this this kind of seed the, this is the peanut halves you can also use whole peanuts but peanut halves are very good in feeders and many birds like them more than you might might think so woodpeckers of course are the basic ones blue jays as I said before will do just about anything for peanuts so they will twist and hang off the peanut feeder and and pig out on them <laughs> Thank you, my great helper. An unusual kind of seed, which is not available everywhere, is called safflower seed. It looks like this. It looks like a white sunflower seed, but it's smaller. It also has a shell with a kernel inside. And we use this because squirrels in general don't like it, and because the big bully birds, the blackbirds, don't tend to like it either. However, there is a whole suite of finches, especially, that do like it, and cardinals. Cardinals really like safflower seed. So it's safflower, S A F F, safflower as opposed to sunflower seed. It is also an oil seed, so it's also quite nutritious for the birds. We keep a we keep a safflower feeder going all year round because we get the purple finches all year round, and in the summertime we get rose-breasted grosbeaks, and if we get really lucky, we might get a cardinal turn up from time to time. But we don't live in an area where there are a lot of cardinals, so we hardly ever see them. You people who live in the city are lucky because you get cardinals frequently. Their beautiful bright red scarlet plumage is just a delight, especially in the winter when the snow is all over. And the last kind of seed I'm going to show you is called Niger seed. It's a very tiny, very tiny little seed. It's black and it also has a shell. So the birds will usually sit on the feeder. Of course, there's other birds who don't, but they'll sit right on the feeder and they'll chew off the shell right there. So you often get quite a lot of block underneath the feeder on the ground. This is not, it's not because the feeder is leaking, it's because the birds are chewing off the shell and dropping them straight down on the ground. Now this particular seed is also mixed with something else. You probably can't tell what it is, but the white, the white bits or the light colored bits mixed in there are actually chips of sunflower seed and this this mixture has been incredibly successful um, it also brings in other birds into the niger seed feeder other than just the finches so I find that the chickadees and the red breasted nighthatch and the um, and the downy woodpecker are coming into the to the night with what's usually a finch feeder and picking out the little the little tiny bits of sunflower seed so I found that with, with using this particular mix, which is available at the birdhouse as well, and only at the birdhouse, you won't find it in the grocery store. It's called um, nigh chip, meaning it's got niger seed and chips, sunflower seed chips in it. It's great. It's, it's very new, and um, I highly recommend it. It greatly increased the, uh, the variety of birds at our, at our, our niger seed feeder. And we're, here we have on the safflower feeder the bully bird of the bird world who just flew. Well, he'll come back. This is what it's like with birding. They come and they go very quickly. You have to, watch, you have to look really quickly at them. Now at the safflower feeder, the big one, this guy cafe, the rose-breasted grosbeak just came in. 
This is one of our larger finches. And if you notice, it's got a, a very pronounced eye stripe. The white, a white eye stripe. That's the female. No, that's an immature male, actually. There's a little hint of pink on his breast. But the eye stripe, he's still an Im half an immature plumage and half an adult plumage. If we get lucky, a nice big... Oh, there's the bully of the bird world, the grackle coming in. He doesn't really like safflower, but sometimes... Oh, but they can be a real pest sometimes because they're larger and more aggressive than the other birds. And they tend to scare them away. Notice the yellow eye. Or whitey yellow eye. He's basically a very large black bird. Now if we look at the peanut feeder, there's a chickadee on it right now. Black cap chickadee. They're very easy to identify. Most people are familiar with black cap chickadees. Now if we focus on the um, sunflower seed feeder for a second. There is a juvenile purple finch sitting on that feeder. And you can tell because they're, um, they're very, very stripy, but they've got that large finch beak. And what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll chew off the shell on the sunflower seed and then swallow the, the, um, the inside, swallow the kernel. Now there's a black-capped chickadee coming in again to the sunflower seed. Oh, and, and there's a woodpecker on the peanut feeder. That's our hairy woodpecker, and it's a male. And you can tell it's a male because it's got that black patch on the back of his head. Now there's, there's another kind of woodpecker called a downy woodpecker, which is virtually identical, but the difference is much, much smaller. Oh! There's a red-bellied woodpecker on the peanut feeder. Now red-bellied woodpeckers, we used to have to go down to Niagara to see those because they're very rare up here. Now they become much less uncommon but they love peanut feeders. That's called a red-bellied woodpecker. He's hiding on the other side of the feeder at the moment. He'll peek out from time to time. There he is. Now if you notice on this bird, he has two patches of red, which means that he's juvenile, which is really great news because it means that they're, his parents were breeding here this summer. So the red is on his, right on, between his eyes on his forehead and at the back of the head. Now when he's an adult, the red will extend all the way from his beak all the way down to the nape of his, nape of his neck. So this is very exciting. This is one of the very few birds that um, are having a positive reaction to climate change in that they're, um, they're moving, their, moving their range further north. Oh, there's the hairy woodpecker again. The bigger one. Quite the beak on him. And notice he has a red patch on the back of his head too. So that's the male. And he will sit there and eat seeds. But he won't carry them away generally. Generally he'll just eat them right there. What he's doing is breaking up the peanuts a little bit so they're a little easier to swallow. Oh look there's a goldfinch on it. That we just came in for a quick look. Goldfinches are American goldfinches are bright yellow. They're often known as some um, on a tree. Yeah. Now this is this is one of the reasons oh there it's our marauding squirrel, one of them. This is one of the reasons we have squirrel-proof feeders hanging here. And he knows now that he can't get down to that feeder. Because what happens is when he gets down to the feeding ports, the feeding ports close up with his weight. Great feeders. The peanut feeder is the same. Well, oh, there he is trying to get down to the, to the hummingbird feeder too. No, we gave up. Well, thank you very much for listening to our, our webinar today. Many thanks to my assistant, Jane, who, or Vanna, <laughs> who helped me with the, um, 
with showing you the feeders and the books. I greatly appreciate it. She's a she's a um, a strong supporter of the Kuchijin Conservancy and an active active volunteer. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> I look forward to answering your questions after this, after we're finished here. I have lots more things to tell you. Um, I could probably keep talking for another two hours, but I won't do that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right, I'm going to switch back to our PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Those squirrels, they are persistent. <laughs> okay, so... Um, you should have a chat button and you can, um, send any questions. You can change who you're sending it to. So either you can just leave it as a sending to everyone, or you can, um, change it so that you're just sending it to the Kuchin Conservancy, which Courtney, um, is here and she's managing, um, those questions. We actually do have some questions that people um, submitted as they registered. So Courtney can share those. That's fine, Courtney. <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for that video. Uh, thank you to Janet and Vanna. Uh, also, thanks to the person behind the camera. Um, it was a really great effort, and I can't believe you were be able to get footage of birds at feeders, because I've tried that myself before, and it has been less than successful. Uh, so I'm going to start. Uh, I see there's already been a really great question come in the chat, but I'm going to start with the ones that we got ahead of time. Uh, some came through Eventbrite, which you used to register, and one came from Instagram. So the one I'm going to start with to Janet is, how do I attract insect eating birds to my feeders? Let's just double check that Janet has her audio turned on. It shows that she it shows is, she does. Yeah. It might be that her um, that her ear she has fancy headphones and earphones. I think that her I think I can hear it. There you oh, go. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Would you like me to read it again, Janet? Yes, please. Okay, so the first question came in to us is, how do I attract insect eating birds to my feeders? Well, that's an interesting question. Generally, the birds that we are feeding at feeders are seed eaters because that's the kind of feed that we put out for them. Um, however, there is a way. There's two ways. First way is to use suet which I talked about suet feeders earlier on in the video. So you can purchase that. It usually comes in small squares or balls. And you fit it into a feeder. That's just to hold it and then gives the bird something to sit on. And suet is, is, is like a meat kind of. So it's like an insect is a meat, right? Sort of. <laughs> and it's a really, really neat kind of suet you can get at the Birdhouse Nature Company. It's called insect suet. It actually has dried insects right in the mixture. The birds oh. love it. It's a little more expensive, but it's worth it. It really brings them in. I don't feed suet in the summertime because it does, it does tend to really dry in the big black grackles, the bully birds. We, um, we got another question. That I supplementary. Think There's a supplementary question here. About yeah. What you look yeah. To good suet. Yeah. Uh, cheap stuff. And quite frankly, usually the stuff that you see in the grocery stores or in the hardware stores, not to, not to malign them, but not very good quality suet. Well, you know, the best way to find out if it's a good quality suet is to put an expensive one right next to a, to a cheap one and watch which ones the birds eat first. You'd be amazed. That's a great tip. <laughs> <laughs> Data, it always tells the truth. Um, our next question uh, was also submitted to us early, which is um, best squirrel proof feeders and do squirrels need feeding too? Sorry, that's my cat. Well, need feeding, but of course, her. every animal has to eat. Every animal has to eat. But there are some real, there are real problems with feeding the squirrels. I mean, certainly if the squirrels can get out your bird feeders, they'll empty them in no time flat. And they'll also tend to chase the birds away. So they're not desirable at bird feeders. The other problem is that if you, if, if, 
I should back up a little bit and just say there's something, there's a concept called carrying capacity. And what that means is that every acre of land has the ability to, to feed and, and, and house a certain number of animals. So for instance, you need you know, so many acres of woodland for one deer or so many acres of, of, of habitat for one skunk or one family of skunks. And generally, if you feed the squirrels, particularly if you feed them as much as they want, you, you, you've messed up with that. You'll get too many, too many squirrels in one small area. And the downside of that is that the, the squirrels start to suffer. They start to see um, aggressive behaviors and weird behaviors. And you'll also start to see disease coming in because they're just too close together. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why it's not a good idea to feed squirrels. I'm not a fan at all. That's a great answer. Thank you. Understood all that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last question that we had submitted early came through from Instagram. And that question is, what is the best seed for winter birds? For winter birds. Well, for winter birds, it's basically the same as the feed that you're feeding in the summer. But usually I only feed the, um, the suet in the wintertime. It's, it's very, very nutritious for them. But I only do it in the wintertime because of the big black birds which leave in September. So they should be leaving right about now. Um, so other than that, other than adding in suet as, an, as, a, as a supplement, winter time. Any of the oil <laughs> seeds are excellent. So the black oil seed or the safflower seed, niger seed, they're all what they call oil seeds. They have a, a very high oil content and they're more nutritious. But they are nutritious for the birds. Um, so I would stick with pretty much, and peanuts of course. Peanuts are very nutritious for the birds. So what you're looking for is a high fat content and um, um, for the birds. So sunflower seeds, peanuts, niger seed, do it, all of those. It's kind of making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I know whenever I get out the peanut seed to feed the birds, I'm always like, oh, I could really do with some peanut butter. <laughs> and uh, we got a really great question from, and she already told me earlier how to pronounce it, and I already have forgotten. Uh, Ellen, I'm hoping I got it right. Um, why are bird sunflower seeds marked as not for human consumption? Uh, just because they aren't inspected or is it because they may have been sprayed heavily in the field? I always wonder um, if because most of them are short lived, we shouldn't be concerned about the plant's treatment. We shouldn't be concerned about what? Uh, the, the plant's treatment. So I think what she's saying is um, because birds are short-lived, we should be concerned about the way that the plants were grown. You certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to feed your birds anything that has been heavily treated with chemicals. I, I, I certainly wouldn't. That's why I don't, I, don't, um, I don't use what... There's a certain kind of um, seed that's sold in some places that's called anti-squirrel bird seed. And what they do is they add pepper to the mix. And I haven't seen any research to tell me that that's not harmful to the birds, so I don't recommend it. But no, I would not use any, any seed that has been treated with anything harmful, or pesticides or herbicides, that sort of thing. But that's not the reason why it's marked as not for human consumption. In fact, you can eat it, won't hurt you. I've munched on a few sunflower seeds myself, and a few peanuts. It's just that there are certain, certain levels of, um, um, I don't know what you call it, um, certain guidelines that, that food has to has to meet before it could be confirmed for human consumption. I don't know why the birds would be any less important than the humans, but there you go. But it doesn't mean it's going to hurt you or anything. And it doesn't mean that anything is bad for the birds. Sorry, that was a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we had another question come in from Ron, and it asks, if you were have more feeders of different types, do you get more birds? Sometimes you do, yes. It depends on the habitat that you live in as well. So if you're in a habitat, that's, that's probably the most important thing is having a very diverse habitat around. So different kinds of trees, shrubs with berries, um, lots of hiding places for the birds. That will determine more how many birds you actually get at your feeder. But, if you have, but some of the birds certainly prefer different sorts of feeds. So for instance, if you watch chickadees very closely, they will generally go into the sunflower seed, usually, even though it looks like they're way too big for them. And 
they'll grab a little sunflower seed and they'll dash away to the tree and sit there and whack it open and eat the kernel on the inside. Um, woodpeckers, for instance, um, don't eat as much of the regular bird feed, um, but they really love those peanuts and they love the suet. So I certainly found one of the most successful things I've done in recent years is to put out a peanut feeder. And that's proved to be probably the most popular feeder in our, in our whole selection. That's great. And we had another really great question that I wouldn't have thought of, which is, um, can you recognize individual blue jays from one another? Very tough unless there's something remarkable about them. Um, I mean, part of what's important for birds is that they are, they are able to recognize each other, so they all look exactly the same. Sometimes you'll get a blue jay that has um, um, a, bit of, a bit of a wonky crust, like he hasn't got all his feathers or something. That happens occasionally. Sometimes you get the one with, that has a bare neck and hasn't got any feathers on its neck, or it's missing a, a particular bunch of feathers on their wing or something. But it would be really hard. It would be really hard for me. Now, I know I can recognize the Carolina wren that we have coming to our feeders because, only because there's only one. And I know it's a female because she never sings. But <laughs> certainly, as our birds are changing plumage, we've been able to recognize individuals. There was one. Red Billy Woodpecker at the feeders we saw earlier. He's sort of a, 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 um, an immature that's just changing into male plumage. And because he has a particular pattern of red on his head, we can recognize him. But it's very, very hard to recognize individuals. Very hard. So we should just pick one name for all of them. <laughs> They're that's all Chicky. Charlie. <laughs> There's Chicky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we got another uh, question. What about a platform feeder? What kinds of birds uh, like those or what would that attract? Basically all the birds like the platform feeders. The trouble with platform feeders is, well, they're big enough that the blue jays can land and the morning doves can land and all the bigger birds can land, including, including the blackbirds, which you may or may not want to have at your feeders. We have a couple, we don't worry about them too much. But the trouble with platform feeders is it's very, very easy for the squirrels to get on them. You know, squirrels, once they get onto a feeder, they just empty it. So that's, I, I really like platform feeders, and we actually have one as well. But it's set up in a very particular way, so the squirrels can't get to it. Uh, I had another great question. They're kind of coming in thick and fast and trying to make sure. Um, I'm sorry if I skip anybody. Uh, there's one that came in. Do you have any comments about neighborhood Merlins? Uh, they have a bad rap, so any comments are appreciated. Neighborhood Merlins. Okay, for those who don't know, a Merlin is a kind of falcon. And um, they're a predatory bird, of course, and they eat other birds. And I mean, I guess basically my attitude is, well, everybody's got to eat, right? So Merlin's got to eat, and so do sort of the, the um, Sharpshin hawks and sort of the Cooper's hawks, sort of vultures for that matter, though they don't tend to take live prey. Good old nature. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, nature sort of bred in tooth and claw, but I mean, that's the way it is. That's life. <laughs> All right. It's always and, very uh, upsetting when they come in and they take your favorite cardinal. It's very upsetting or take a chickadee. <laughs> it is, it is sad, <laughs> but it is life. Yeah, I would be very excited if we had a Merlin here because they're not a common bird at all. Yeah. They were really, really beautiful. Really um, beautiful. They fly like <laughs> Another Blue Jay related question. Is there a way to tell, and I've wondered this myself, is there a way to tell between male and female Blue Jays? Well, the only way really, if you're ready for this, is to see them copulating. Because generally ah. the male is on top. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's really tough. They're pretty, they're virtually identical. Hmm. So you would really have to pry. All right, and um, we have another question about the location of a bird feeder. So how far from your windows should you be placing your bird feeders? Well, there's a rule of thumb. If you have them at least three feet away from your windows, then that's good. They can be closer, but three feet at the minimum, and about 15 feet away. It's a good, so between three and 15 feet away from your windows. And the reason for that is because when, um, when they're 15 feet away, they don't, they're not as likely to run into the window. When they're three feet away, they're so close that they don't have enough time to get up enough speed to really injure themselves, even if they do hit the window. And 
all of our most of our feeders are, are within three feet because because we have to guard against bears at our house we've had to hang our feeders from the eaves troughs so they're at least 20 feet in the air so the only place to put them at our place for us to see them as you saw in the, earlier in the video is right outside those second story windows so it makes it really great to, um, to be able to see them so closely and clearly. Yeah, it's true. I'm going to ask, I think there's somebody that's not muted and maybe we're hearing them, maybe we're hearing a TV. So I'll just ask you to check that you're on mute. Um, whoever it is, I can't see you on my screen. So uh, just so you know. Um, I got another question and this is from Chris. Chris is wondering, is there a way to discourage morning dubs? Why would you want to? <laughs> I know that my teenage self wanted to because I didn't like to get up that early. <laughs> well, the best way to discourage morning dubs is just it's very simple. Just use feeders that they can't get onto. They're rather fat birds. So use feeders with very short perches. Don't use a platform feeder. Just use feeders so you just watch and you can see them sort of flapping around and they can't quite get onto it. Or if you do want to feed them, you can put seed on the ground for them. Or let them just pick up whatever seed already has fallen to the ground. They're, they're good at cleaning up that way. That's great. Um, okay, so we got another question that says, this is now, uh, I think they mean this is not bird feeding related, but bird naming. How did birds get their names? It seems like some names don't make sense, like red-bellied woodpecker doesn't have a red belly. Actually, in breeding season, a red-bellied woodpecker does have a red belly. It's just sort of faintly pink, right, right way down on its belly, not on its chest or its breast. It's right way down on its belly. But you have to see them in breeding season to see that. Quite often, some of those names come from when you hold them in your hand. You can see these features. Um, but maybe you can't see them when they're just sort of out there on a tree. But the names are actually determined by an organization called the American the AOU, American Ornithologist Union. And they have the authority to, to name birds and to change names. It drives us all crazy, actually, because sometimes they'll, they'll change names. I mean, the Oriole is a good example. It's been changed from, from Northern Oriole to Baltimore Oriole, back to Northern Oriole, back to Baltimore Oriole again. So I don't know whether you get to count two species on your list or not. <laughs> I would definitely count to. Uh, we had another question come in from Karen, and she's saying that their chickadees and nut hatches uh, clean out the sunflower feeders every two to three days. So they're little piggies, and uh, they seem to be taking more than they are currently eating. Is there a way to limit the quantity they eat without leaving the feeders empty? I limit the quantities that the birds eat. Yeah. Um, well, clearly you have enough birds that that um, that they're eating everything that you're putting out for them. So I, I don't know whether you'd want to limit them or not. You probably have fewer birds um, if you did that. Sorry, I was just reading a question on the screen. Oh, okay. All right. About so, mustard seeds. Oh. Huh. Yeah. So um, Kathy said, love all these interesting answers, Janet. And she's absolutely right. And oh, Helen nice. asked, uh, are black mustard seeds good for birds or are they just a cheap filling? Not sure if I should preserve or abandon putting them out. Black mustard seed. I'm not sure what she's talking about. There is a small black, round black seed that you sometimes see in the mixtures. And it is a filler, yes. And the way you can really tell is if you look underneath your feeder and see what's left on the ground that the birds are not eating, then clearly that's a filler. It's not something they like. Another one to avoid is, is a, a large round white seed called, called millet. And very few of the birds actually eat millet. And they, they do use that as a filler for sure. That's great to know. I just want to let everybody know that we're getting uh, five minutes from end time and there's still lots of great questions. So we'll get through as many as we can. And uh, there they are great questions. And thank you, Janet. So uh, One more addendum to that taking more, that question about them taking more than she thinks they need. Yeah. 
Quite a few of the birds are actually storing food for the winter. So blue jays and chickadees actually will store food and they remember where they've cached them, believe it or not. They'll come back for them later on. So sometimes they do, they are taking more than you might, you might think they actually need. That was a good comment from one of our participants. Yeah. Um, another one from Danielle is the black oil sunflower seed shells are really piling up on the ground and keeping the grass from growing. Do you just sweep up every day? No, I don't sweep up every day, but I do take a wreck to it every now and again. Um, the other thing you can do is with many feeders, you can add a tray on the bottom of the feeder. You may have seen that with the, with the examples of feeders that we had earlier. And the purpose of the tray is just to catch some of that debris. Um, although some of that is, is good is good seed still has naturally been eaten so I don't know but I know if we usually do our cleanup in the spring sometimes in the fall and a good rake sometimes a broom but there is a very good mixture of seed called garden friendly that you can get at the birdhouse it has no shells at all in it it's just full of the things that birds really love and it's a very nice mixture a little more money because it's but it's very very rich I certainly recommend that it's called bird friendly or garden friendly I can tell you all about it at the store. <laughs> That's a great way to solve that problem. <laughs> it is actually. Yeah. Um, and I got another question. Uh, how much of a bird's diet comes from feeders? What if I forget to fill my feeders for a few weeks? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, it says how much of a bird's diet comes from feeders? What if I forget to fill my feeders for a few weeks? Actually, birds get about, I think the numbers I've seen is something like about 15% of their, of their um, total diet from bird feeders. So that means they're getting 85% of their food from the wild. So in fact, if you forget to feed, fill them for a few weeks or if you go away for the winter, it's not as big a problem as you might think it was. The birds will disperse. I mean, they can fly, right? So they'll go in, they'll go in other places to find food. Awesome. Uh, we have... Another one here from Janet, she says, like Karen, we go through lots of seed, but suet in particular. Those suet blocks are gone in a day. Is there a way to distribute the suet to last longer? And thanks so much for this evening's presentation. I've learned a lot. Oh, you're more than welcome, Janet. Um, well, the feeder that I showed earlier that has a cage around it, the suet feeder, that stops um, things like squirrels from emptying out the suet feeder. I mean, that would be my first thought is that there's a squirrel or something like that that's getting at the suet. Um, but it, you may, it, it may just be that you have enough birds that that's, that's as much as they can eat in a day. I think we probably go through maybe a half a cake every day, maybe more. We always seem to be going into the birdhouse to get more suet. <laughs> Uh, we had a comment, and I think it's going to be the last one I read because we've only got two minutes left. So, um, and it's from Catherine, and it says, "Thanks, great information provided." Um, More than and welcome. I know, yeah, <laughs> I know. I myself have learned a lot, and lots of bird food for thought, I guess. But uh, thank, thank you so much, Courtney, for helping and, with the questions. Uh, I don't know. If I don't know if Tanya has uh, one more slide for everyone. And uh, I can I can mute myself here. Bye, Courtney. Thanks again. Thanks for doing that Q and A, Courtney. That was really interesting. We uh, we did a like a little test run um, the other day, and even just between the few of us that were on the test run, we were like throwing questions all around. So yeah, lots of interest in how to support um, our feathered friends. So thanks uh, so much for coming this evening. Thank you so much to Janet for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, the slide that I'm just sharing right now is talking about some other upcoming um, events that are going on. Our next uh, Passport to Nature webinar is with Cam Curran, who is actually on this call. Um, he's gonna be sharing some camera um, tips and tricks, so really looking forward to that. And uh, of course, the Nature Thon. And you can always go to our website and find out um, what's going on and connect with us on social media. And I think that's everything. Thank you so much, Janet, again. Thank you to Kathy and Jane uh, for helping to coordinate this event. And uh, that's all. So we'll see you again. I really hope to see everyone in person soon, but 
you know, even just this is, is good for now, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Tanya and Courtney. Thanks, Thank Janet. You, awesome. Everyone. Great. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs>